Now we have another very special experience for you. Um, it gives me a great deal of um, excitement and pride and pleasure to introduce to you the eighth commissioner of the LPGA, Mr. Mike Wan. Okay, how you guys doing? That's better than I usually get from the player, so thank you. The hardest thing I do in my job, and Pam knows this, is when somebody says, come on in and just talk for four or five minutes. I don't have four or five minutes in me, so I apologize in advance for throwing off your schedule. Um, I don't know if, uh, if we'll have much in common, but I'll give you a little background on myself. I, um, I grew up in Chicago, uh, and I started caddying when I was uh, 11 and 12. My father used to drop me off at a country club, and the deal was I had to have $35 in my pocket when he picked me up at 5 o'clock, because the only way to get $35 is you had to do two loops. Uh, and you could kind of kill a hot dog and a Diet Coke in there, but I mean, you pretty much had to do two. So if he picked me up and had 17 bucks, he knew I was loafing or hitting balls at the range or something. So uh, I kind of started around a golf course. When I was uh, 14, I got an opportunity to work um, in the pro shop or on the grounds crew. And this will tell you a little bit about myself. So all my buddies worked in the pro shop. They wore nice clothes, they got tips, all the members knew them. You know those people, those are the ones that are wiping off your clubs and you know, telling you what's on sale at the pro shop. I wasn't that guy. I was the guy that you were going, when is he gonna get off the green? Doesn't he know I'm about to hit onto the green? I took the uh, grounds crew job. We started at 5.30, which for me is fine. 5.30 has never been a problem in my life. I have lunch about 10, I have dinner about two, and I go to bed about five, so I'm ready for, I'm ready for Scottsdale. I just, I'm not there yet, but I'm ready for retirement. Um, so I decided to do that because you finished work at 2.30 and then you played golf for free. So I would go home at 2.30, I'd sleep for an hour and at 4 o'clock and uh, we had moved to Ohio by this time and in Cincinnati, if you tee off at 4 o'clock, you can play 27 holes before you really have to go home and I was a, it was a bike ride to, uh, to work so I could bike home in the dark and that's really kind of how golf became part of my life. I, um, I started working there, I, I ended up working at that, at that club all the way through until I finished college and still think to this day I couldn't afford to join that club, but I played that club more than most members over the course of my six years working there. Uh, golf's a weird thing for me. My family and I have a, a weird thing when it comes to golf. Um, we aren't, uh, it, when I was 36, which is amazing to admit to you, was the first time my father said I love you. I know he always did, but they're just kind of, they're old Iowa folks and they don't say I love you, which is really weird. So I say it every morning, every night to my kids because I'm trying to break the the Juan regime. But the one thing that happens is we get on a golf course and we're like uh, the Partridge family. Like we, everything comes out. So my father told me about the birds and the bees, which was an interesting nine holes on a golf course. <laughs> He was so much more nervous than me. And, um, and on the back nine, I tried to act like it was all brand new to me. But the, um, we, uh, my, my mother got sick at some point, you know, when she was, uh, got older, and I found out about that on a golf course. My sister has, got, uh, has had some medical issues. I found out about that on a golf course. When my father's father died, I was told on a golf course. When I told my dad I was getting married, I told him on a golf course. So you see a theme here. Um, so for me, it's always been kind of a, this is a terrible thing to say if you're deeply religious, but for me, the golf course is a church-like experience. We do things on a golf course in our family. We can't do it at a dinner table, and for some reason, we can't do it at church. I don't know why, but that's the way it is. So uh, I started working at Procter & Gamble when I got out of school. I went to school in Ohio, at Miami of Ohio, and um, I remember waking up about 28 years old. We had just come back from a dinner party in the neighborhood, and my wife said the whole way home from the dinner party, I was the brand manager of Crest Toothpaste, which is, only seems like about 90 years ago. And she said, will you stop talking about tartar control when we're with our friends? You know, because <laughs> I was into it. You know, you want to talk gum health? I'm your guy. Um, which is pretty exciting, because before Crest, I was the brand manager of Metamucil, so I made a huge, uh, <laughs> true story. Uh, so I made a huge upgrade when I made it to Crest. But I remember thinking, my wife said, you know, nobody else cares about teeth like you do. Give it a rest. And she was dead right. And I remember laying there that night thinking, what is wrong with me? Like, I'm really focused on Tarticle. I'm waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning to go solve the world's cavity problems. And nothing against cavity problems, but that's not me. I mean, that's not how I grew up. That's not who I am. And uh, so I left Procter & Gamble when I was 29 and took a job as the uh, VP of uh, golf balls and golf gloves at Wilson Sporting Goods in Chicago. Got me home to Chicago, got me into the golf business. I'll never forget the meeting I had at Procter & Gamble. The guy was, you know, probably my age. I was thinking he was really old at the time. But he's probably my age sitting across from this 29-year-old. And he said, Mike, what are you doing? I mean, you're on this, you know, ship called Procter & Gamble, and you're going you're gonna to make it and be, you know, pretty serious in the business world. And you, 
you're going to go work on golf balls? I mean, that's what you do on the weekend. And um, I remember sitting across when I was 29, I had my first moment of clarity, and I said, he said, you're never going to get to the promised land that way. That was the exact phrase. And I said, I guess for the first time in my life, I realized that your promised land and my promised land are just different lands, you know? And I mean, I could wake up at 60 and have worked 40 years, and my big moment is going to be that I'm in charge of oral care. And, you know, I mean, that's... Uh, <laughs> And if anybody here works for P&G or Unilever or J&J, I apologize, but I was on that path and, quite frankly, would have uh, easily finished that path. I didn't have a problem with how big the company was, didn't have a problem with living in Cincinnati, although a lot of Cincinnatians do. Um, it was just, uh, there was a lot of reasons why people left P&G, but mine wasn't one. I just realized that I had to put the passion together with the business. And so I'm hoping that's why some of you are here today. You know, I mean, there's business and there's passion. And when you get a chance, and you don't get that many, to jam them together, then you got something pretty cool. Pam knows this story, but my mom is um, 72. She'd be glad I told you that. And she lives in Scottsdale, uh, now retired, and she plays golf six days a week. They take off Saturday because there's too many people on the course. Um, <laughs> I'll never, you know, I'll never forget when I was there for a spring break with my kids, and my, my dad came down and he said, well, play the back nine or the front nine first. And I'm like, that's their big moment for the day, you know? <laughs> and I was so jealous, I couldn't believe it. Um, but she plays almost every day, and she didn't start playing until she was 59. I mean, 59 is the first time she picked up a golf club. And I was playing with her, this is years ago, probably seven, eight years ago. I worked at TaylorMade at the time, so I went from Wilson to TaylorMade. And of course, I was trying to sell her some driver or something on the fairway. And I said, Mom, why did you wait so long? I mean, was it the kids and Little League and all my stupid things and my sister's things? And I'll never forget, she looked me right in the face and she goes, 59 was the first time I was invited. And my mom's not, you know, that kind of person. But she looked at me and I chuckled and she didn't. And I thought, damn, I mean, she's serious, you know? And she said, I've never, uh, she wasn't your fault, wasn't your father's fault. Just, I never really felt invited on a golf course. And she said, the last thing I would have done is learn how to play on a golf course. But she said, we moved here in Scottsdale. Seven ladies have a Thursday outing. There's no men allowed on Thursday afternoon. And it was an incredibly comfortable place to learn. And now my mom and dad, uh, which is amazing to think, have such a better marriage because of golf at age 72 than they did at 42, which is, I guess, first time I've said that out loud, but that's true. You know, 42, you're doing what I'm doing, which is one's going that way to the basketball game and one's going that way to the soccer game. And occasionally you get a vacation for four days, but even then you're really figuring out your plans for when you get back from vacation. And now that's, uh, it's all about golf. So when I go home now, and you can imagine my current job, my parents can't wait to parade me around their club. You know, this is Mike, he's a commissioner of the OPJ. Um, <laughs> Like they think that's going to get them a dues cut or something, you know. But it's, uh, it's pretty cool. So golf is, uh, golf is still kind of ingrained in our life um, like it was at a young age. I mean, when I was cutting, I mean, true story, I mean, my 14 and 15 years, I was what they called, uh, uh, I shouldn't probably tell you the whole name, but it was bunker somethings. And the somethings is probably not a great term. But that's what you were your first year. And if you could survive your first year as bunker boys, we'll call it, um, you could actually move on next year and ride something that cut grass. But the first year, you literally had to just pull weeds out of sand traps. And suffice it to say, I'll never go back to that, you know, because there's not a harder job in the world than, you know, 4,000 degrees and you're pulling, uh, you're pulling weeds out. So come full circle to, again, I have no idea what Pam wanted me to talk about. And I've so far <laughs> said nothing that I planned to say to you when I got up here. But, um, but I do hope that you'll, you'll continue to find this passion. And when you find friends that have it too, invite them. You know, because it's a shame we ate sometimes till we're 59 to put your passion together. I waited till I was 29, and I think I waited nine years longer than I wish I would have. I wish I'd have started this. Wish I would have had the guts to go after it right out of school, but I didn't. Um, I wish I would have had the smarts to invite my mom when she was 39, not when she was 59. Um, and, I, and I hope that you all that have friends that are kind of on the fence can find a comfortable place to bring them into this game. Because at the end of this day, this game's going to die without women. It's just going to die without women. There's just no other way, shape, or form about it. And I, trust me, every guy who plays the game knows it. They may not like it. In fact, most of them don't. Um, but they know it, which is, you know, if this game is really going to be something, um, it better be social. It, it better mix. It better not care if you're 18 or if you're 38. Uh, you know, I, I belong to a club that's in a course that I live in, and of course my kids have to tuck their shirts in. So they play about two times a year for the sole reason that they won't tuck their shirt in. My 16-year-old will not play a game if he has to tuck his shirt in. And I'm thinking to myself, I've gone to our board many times going, seriously, can we lose the tuck-in rule? Just, I want my kids out here. You know, I want them learning, and they'll tuck in later, you know. But I think that's sometimes we get caught up in our own, you know, our own psyche sometimes. 
But um, I think you all know in the room, it's a great game. It's been a great, you know, it's been a great life lesson for me. The most surprising thing that happened when I joined the LPGA in January 2010, so I left the golf business in 99, 2000-ish, and um, I had gone to a women in golf summit in Pinehurst, like in 96. Uh, some of you may have been to Pinehurst in 96. And the idea of the summit was, are we ever really going to grow the professional game if all the pros only come from the U.S. and Europe? And to think about that today, I mean, it's mind-boggling to think. And so the basic conclusion was, do we really believe we're really going to get girls around the world to pick up this game? I mean, that's, it's far-fetched. I mean, this is 95, 96. And um, so I came back in January 2010, been away from the game a long time. And I walked into my first press conference, and I'll bet just 60 to 70% of the questions from the media was, how are you going to deal with the Asian influence on tour? How are you going to deal with the fact that players come from all over the world, and they're not like Americans, and American uh, sponsors won't get it, and some of them don't speak English? And I remember, you know, this is before I got media trained, so I just said what I would say, which is, <laughs> as Craig knows, that's a scary thing when I just say what I say. Since then, he's got a hold of me. Um, I said, are you guys kidding me? I mean, if you tell me I could be the commissioner in 1993, that essentially had all their players come from Europe and U.S., which meant all your sponsors come from Europe and U.S., which means all your fans come from Europe and U.S., and which means the only people that ever watch you on TV are going to be Europe and the U.S. So I could be that guy, or I could be the guy in 2010 that you're questioning who's really got players from 32 different countries. 160 countries are going to watch us this week. I mean, this week, from Irving, Texas, 160 countries will watch us. Young girls are growing up in virtually every corner of the world and not only believing that they can do this, they got a role model. They got somebody who's already done it. And I said, you know, you guys, uh, because these are old golf guys, no offense to the old golf guys, because I guess I'm one of them, but I mean, I said, you know, shame on you guys. I mean, this is the kind of thing that 20 years ago we prayed for. Now it's come true, and you're asking me how am I going to control it or manage it? I said, all I'm going to do is foster it. I said, I'm going to throw fertilizer on this as fast as I can. We're going to be the greatest world tour. And uh, I'll never forget afterwards, I did an interview with USA Today. This was in New York. And afterwards, the USA Today guy said, can I just talk to you for a second about your question and about your answer on influence and everything else? And uh, he said, you know, why do you believe that's going to work? I mean, I think as you get more players from Korea and Japan, he'd whisper, with you, Korea. Like, you can say Korea. It's all right. You know, um, <laughs> but how are you going to deal with players from all these other countries and make it success? And I said, do you watch the Olympics? And he said, yeah. I said, do you find that compelling? He said, yeah. And I said, because it's the best players from every part of the world. They strive their whole life to get there. Each one of their stories is unbelievable. It doesn't matter if you grew up in, in Germany or, or Geronimo or, or Bahamas. It's, uh, it's a strive to get to the top 150 player in the world. And when you watch that competition, you realize they're so much more alike than they're different. And when you guys spend a couple, couple of days out here, if you come out and watch us on the weekend, you'll find there's no difference between Athahara Munoz, Inby Park, and Angela Stanford. They're all young, overachieving females who have so much more in common than difference. And watch how much fun they have together. So us getting over it is just a matter of us getting over it. And really, that's what's happened on the LPGA the last four or five years. All started before I got here, and will all definitely go on after I'm gone. But what's happened on the LPGA is the world gives a crap. That's really what happened, is today when we play, we'll have the highest ratings in golf in Korea. We'll have unbelievable ratings in Japan. They'll be watching us in India. They'll be watching us in Australia and Taiwan. Why will they watch us in Taiwan? Because one of the greatest female athletes in the history of Taiwan is going to be playing. So if you want to watch her, she's here. The best Japanese female golfers in the world play on the LPJ. So I always say, you know, the Olympics made us believe it. We didn't create this format. So we just, our, our goal is to put on the Olympics every week. Get 30 countries out here at the best of the best. Let's put the flags next to their names and let's see who wins. And at the end, you know, uh, everything else takes care of itself. In 2010, about a third of our players didn't speak English. In 2013, I literally don't know a player on tour that I can't have a conversation with. It may not, it may, it may not haven't met her yet, because we may have some rookies that aren't there yet. But as Craig knows, you know, who trains them um, from a media perspective, it's no longer an issue. These girls are learning English before they get here because it's part of being successful here. I was playing in a pro-am in Toledo one time, and it was, I think it was Na Young Choi, and this is 2010. And she started, she started saying, ah, oh, three more holes, three more holes. And I thought she was bored with the pro-am. I'm like, three more holes? She goes, three more holes to the press room. And I said, well, what do you mean? It was a pro-am day. You know, who cares about the press room? She goes, no, no, I got to do a press conference after the pro-am. And I'm like, I do a press conference every day. It's 15 minutes. She goes, yeah, but you do it in English. 
I'm like, yeah, of course I do in English. She goes, English not so good for me. You know, I mean, you could just see. And um, so then I started thinking, imagine if you're one of these top 20 players in the world, and you're on the 17th hole on a Saturday or Sunday, and you're in the hunt, and you know that as soon as you finish, 40 people with microphones and cameras are going to be in your face, and you don't speak the language that well, and which is very cultural, but generally speaking, uh, in Asia, you don't speak a language unless you speak it well. So most of them speak English better than I do, you know, but they want to make sure it's perfected. So, and it's something we had to break down too, which is let it go. Americans will love you if you screw it up because most of us don't speak it that well. Um, <laughs> But one of the reasons that most players now have perfected English before they play here is it makes them a better golfer. I mean, I'd love to lie to you and say it's because they want to talk to you in a pro-am or they're better with sponsors or they want to do TV ads. It's really not it. They're just more comfortable on a golf course. And as all of you know, if you play, and I assume most of you do at some point, you can't play good golf if you're not comfortable. If you don't feel comfortable with what you're wearing, if you don't feel comfortable with the weather, if you don't really like the people you're playing with, you just don't play your best golf. And so they play their best golf because they're comfortable being here. They're comfortable with that media. And that's really, that's what's changed at the LPGA. I would say that tournaments are kind of like, uh, look at me search for an analogy. Uh, it's like a plant, you know. Um, occasionally you get a transplant. We just pick it up and plop it down. New sponsor goes to new place and the money's flowing. And, um, but more often than not, you're going to nurture something from the beginning. And it's going to have a couple of tenuous years. I look at this tournament and say, you got the ingredients of what could be really good. A town that the players love to come. You got 49 of the top 50 players here and one's injured. So I would tell you that we have tournaments that have been around 30 years that would kill for your field. They'd kill for this field. I mean, 49 of 50. On the men's, the, uh, Augusta didn't have 35 of the top 50. So, I mean, we're talking about a serious major field. So that tells me that they want to be here. You know, I mean, they, they actually want to play here. Second thing is you've got a committed uh, club and city. You know, between, between the Nexus Group, between the Las Colinas Country Club, you've got people that want to make this a reality. And the third ingredient you've got is a ton of regional headquarters or national headquarters in Dallas. I mean, you've got what other towns, I mean, Rob, who runs the event from Portland, he's got about four of those. You got four within a four iron of this golf club. So um, those are the right ingredients. For a tournament to really make it and reach to the next level, we're going to need to find a couple of significant check writers that are going to want to turn this tournament into whatever they want to turn it into with us. If they want to make it all about a women's conference, if they want to make it all about a bigger shootout, if they want to make it all about bringing in their top customers. But each tournament sort of builds its own morph. So what we've got to do, I think, over the next couple of years is take this plant and water it, keep using the passion that's here. But um, we got to invest in this. We're a sponsor of this event, too. And we sponsor two events a year. So this is one of them. Um, because we thought the ingredients were right, you know? I don't know. I mean, will we be here five years from now? I don't know, but I bet on it. You know, I mean, I bought the stock. Um, because I believe you got the ingredients that can really work here. Because the number one thing is passionate people. And if you got that, you know, we'll find another way. If, if you can get 49 of the top 50 to show up, everything else is just, you know, everything else is just money. I hate to say that, but I've learned in my business career that if you think money is going to get in your way, then you shouldn't be in business. I mean, money, you can't, you can't stop for that. You find that. Both women and kids are coming in amazing numbers and leaving in amazing numbers. You know, for the retention for both has got to get better. Um, if you, uh, you know, if you look at started the game and became what, the, you know, what they would call a core golfer, which is playing 25 rounds a year, the transition for both kids and women, especially young girls, like under 17 year old girls, um, we just don't see much of that transition. Uh, and that, that's the scary thing is just not getting people that play on a regular basis. I, I don't mean to be uh, theatrical that the game will die. My point is, you know, for this game to be what at least what I want it to be, and what I think it can, what I, what I want the Olympics to, because we're going to start in the Olympics in 16, the Olympics has to celebrate golf as a great worldwide sport that's played by every age and both sexes all around the world, and I think America's got some catching up to do on that. You know, sometimes I think we're way ahead, but we play around the world sometimes where I'd say we're not as bad as we think.